Um, so to start, so remember to keep yourself muted, please, as we go, um, and to put your questions in the chat box, and we'll get started. I'll turn it over to you, Whit. Go ahead. All right. Well, thank you, Caitlin. Appreciate it. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Again, as Caitlin alluded to, we'll have this uh, posted sometime tomorrow uh, for for those of you that or you can share with those who may be interested. Um, I, I just I think it's worthwhile to know where we're headed. Those who've heard me speak before know that I can drone on, so I'm going to give you the game plan. Um, I'll be talking just a little bit about some LMIC, some historic wool data, um, and some storage considerations. Uh, then we'll turn it over to, to Rita and, and, and Peter for some LDP payment information and uh, perhaps some export updates. Um, then we'll, we'll have our colleagues down in Texas, um, either Ronald Pope or Dr. Redden, uh, whoever is on this evening. And then we'll have some, some great conversation with our panelists. And I apologize if some of them are on there that aren't on tonight, but that's who we were planning on. And I think it'll be some good conversation. Uh, first and foremost, I, th I think as an industry that has contracted historically over time in terms of just number of players and producers and sheep, it's, worth, uh, it's worthwhile, I think, revisiting why this communication is so important, especially in the midst of a global pandemic you know, I like this paper uh, out of Australia that just kind of shows on the left some of the value, or I'm sorry, some of the, the players involved in the industry and, and how segmented it can be. And oftentimes information exchange is um, the type of information and the value of the information depends on what stage of the process you're in. I think tonight our hope we're having some conversation uh, with those on the front lines, those who are doing the buying, those who are in the policy, and just share information so that maybe we'll be better off even with some of the challenging market conditions that we're currently in. You know, I, I don't need to drone on for hours about worldwide sheep numbers, but since this is a global uh, commodity that we're dealing with, it is uh, significantly influenced by international trade dynamics. I think it's, under, it's worthwhile to know where we sit in the big scheme of things that uh, circular graph to the right there, you can see that we're not on that uh, graph, we're lumped into other. Um, comparatively speaking, from a wool perspective and sheep number perspective, we're pretty minor players on the international stage, just in numbers. I think something that's interesting, especially as we think about um, that we aren't alone in, in some of the dynamics of, of our national sheep inventory, um, we know that there's been historic decline over time. Um, if you've followed some of the numbers, we're pretty stable, I think, these days. Um, with some of the air involved in the statistics, I think we've, we've kind of stabilized. We've now entered a new stage of uh, uh, dynamics due to this global pandemic, and it'll be interesting to see where we come out of that. Um, in terms of fiber use, uh, fiber consumption by end use, and again, these are all IWTO figures, and I thank Rita for providing these earlier in the week for me to mull over a little bit. Uh, you can see, generally speaking, the, ma the majority or the larger percentage uh, of the endpoint use of a lot of the wool produced internationally is in the apparel market. Um, interior textiles um, are about 31%, and then industrial uses. Um, are at 23% for some of our broader uh, fiber diameters. You know, I, I get the easy job of talking about what's happened and I'm not gonna open up the crystal ball too much. I'm gonna put my panelists on the spot tonight to talk about that. But, um, you know, 2009, uh, we experienced some significant decline in terms of uh, the wool import, imports or exports to major processing countries. You can see, I know there's a little blurry image there, but you can see on average, uh, some of those major um, destinations for uh, the wool product that we produce were down year on year. Uh, China at 9%, India at negative 16%, uh, Italy and Germany about 20% and so on. And so this slowdown, as many of you already know, I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, preceded this pandemic to some degree. You know, I, I appreciate a, a recent webinar that, that we have posted and I'll allude to a little bit later, but this comes from Chris Wilcox in a great 
uh, outlook that he just did yesterday at the IWTO virtual conference. And if you recall in the previous slide, there was some downturn uh, across those different um, destinations. Uh, this again shows a little bit more pronounced downturn. I think what's kind of interesting, and I can't speculate a whole lot other than India uh, appears to be faring a little bit better, that their slowdown hasn't been as dramatic. Um, there are some figures that, that, that alluded to that a little bit earlier, but overall, the, the product that does not stay in our country, which is approximately half, um, we're seeing about significant declines in those, those products destined for, for international markets, some of the shorter and coarser uh, fibers that we're producing. I, I compiled this from LS, LMIC, and, and I may be scolded later because I did some rough um, sheep specialist calculations. I'm not a geneticist, I'm not a mathematician, but uh, it kind of shows in the, the brown bar there is total US greasy wool production. And it goes from 2005 in, in five year increments until we get to 17 and 18. And that was the, the most available information I had. Um, the, the yellow bar actually is, is the total US wool exports. And I think one thing that stands out, obviously, is the decline that we've experienced. You know, I can't speculate, and maybe Rita can allude to this a little bit later. Um, I think exports clearly uh, are not there currently. And the, the outlook that Chris Wilcox gave today, or yesterday rather, um, had some perspectives from, from the Chinese uh, Wool Textile Association and some of the dramatic uh, impacts of the downturn there, both as a result of some of the, the trade conflicts, but also COVID uh, painted a really, um, well, a picture that I wasn't aware of from, a, from their perspective. Um, approximately half of our, our consumption is, or uh, half of our exports are greasy wool, but you can see in the top quarter there, again, relative to some of the major players out there, um, we're about 0.02% of total wool exports internationally. Uh, that's not a lot, obviously. And, but, but what does stand out is, is the impact of what's happening in those larger exporting nations uh, as they influence ours. Uh, again, some more LMIC figures. Again, I took a lumped average from 2005 to 19, and I broke it up by region. And again, there, there's most of us in the Intermountain West, so perhaps the, the territory states prices that are reported to the USDA, which the Livestock Marketing Information Center compiles. Uh, this represents some of that data. And I, I just think it's interesting, in, especially in our region where we consider ourselves, well, we are a premier fiber producing region in the United States in terms of quality, quantity, and value. Um, just some of the, the differences as you move across those micron ranges. Now, I should, I should preface this with the fact is that one of the challenges I think going back to the ability to share information in an industry that's gotten smaller, uh, as you talk to LMIC, and in the figure I'm gonna show you here in a minute, there's holes in the data. And, and the challenge that we have is, is the data is only as good as what's reported. And um, I think overall, that's something that we're seeing the importance of, of USDA's ability to report accurate information, uh, both in our land markets and our wool markets. And uh, encouraging you to do so, I think, for those of you that, that, that do provide that information, it really is critical because it allows us to know where we're headed and also do some, some benchmarking within our businesses. This final graph that I'm gonna show you, this is death by graphs here today, but again, something that, that, that I try to do with this a little bit is again, using those weighted yearly averages reported by the USDA, uh, which is then compiled by the Livestock Marketing Information Center, from 18 micron down all the way up to 30 micron. And, and I think it's no surprise, we all are aware uh, of the value of those finer fibers in terms of overall value. Uh, our yield is extremely important in that equation. Uh, but you know, I, I think from a perspective standpoint, um, uh, where we're at today, and, and we'll know a little bit better uh, when we hear from some of our, our industry, um, it's really hard to go back when you've experienced historic highs. Uh, an example of that I was down in Uruguay this last fall and I got to visit one of the larger top makers down there and he was empty and this was in October. And uh, you know, he, he alluded to the fact that uh, he says, when, when people can get a certain price for their bread, they don't like to give it away for free. 
using an analogy and he, he it was empty. And he said he had been going all over the world to, to different locations because it was a top making facility. He needed that volume. But even the domestic fine wool producers in Uruguay weren't selling because the previous year was so high. And, and that's not an economical theory. That's, that's more of an anecdote. But I think uh, moving forward, um, whether to buy or sell, oftentimes we look at it through the rearview mirrors. Well, it's not as good as last year, but this figure at least kind of shows us a little bit uh, where we may have been in the past in terms of overall value. I think from a, if we were to plot this and do a regression line, we'd see that wool has ex experienced pretty good increases since 2005. And I, uh, again, being the positive one, because I don't, don't have any wool in the shed right now, I, I think that's, a, that's an important perspective to keep an eye on, especially as we come out of this, uh, that wool is the dynamic fiber. It's a fiber that does have a higher price point, but has excellent, excellent physical properties that just can't be mimicked by synthetic fibers. And uh, the overall environmental story that we have to tell with the degradability of wool, uh, the ability to recycle it, just the, the durability and long lasting aspect of that fiber is, is a good story to tell. Uh, you know, I appreciate those of you who, who are visiting with me this week. Uh, something to keep in mind, I think, is, is if we are not going to be selling our wool, I think some of these may be common sense, but oftentimes we're happy to get the wool off the sheep. We peel it off, we tuck it away in the shed, and hope we can get rid of it here before too long for a price. And I think the work that goes into this and the quality of the fiber, it should be a strong consideration how we're storing those this year. It goes without saying that the keeping it dry is a really important component. But one thing that we often don't think about is the ability of of wool, we think about it as a garment, the ability to take moisture and hold about 35% of it before it gets wet. Well, the ground also holds a lot of moisture, and if it's sitting directly on the ground, it has the ability to wick some of that moisture away from the ground. So, so keeping a, a stack of wool or piling your wool so that there's some, some circulation of air, but more so that it's off the ground. Um, I think another thing talking with, with many of you in the industry uh, is, is the the ability to take for granted a, a sound roof and uh, making sure that we have that wool covered up and an extra piece of insurance is covering it with some tar prior to storing it in the shed, uh, both to keep animals off of it, but also to keep the moisture off of it from above. Uh, you know, here, here at, we've had some problems in the past if we've been storing it a couple of years that we do have some moth damage and making sure that uh, you, you keep your, your barn as is, is moth-free as possible. Some, some zap lights in there help to some extent, uh, using some DDT products perhaps to deter some, some penetration of those moths. I think that's more of an issue the longer it sits, but still it's something to keep an eye on uh, as we tend to just stack it and forget about it. And finally, I think those of us in the High Plains, um, Mountain West, we experience some pretty volatile weather. And I think knowing from our insurance adjuster um, what our coverage is in the facilities that we're storing the wool is really important because uh, that wool has tremendous value. Uh, even in a down market right now, it still has a lot of value. Uh, not as much as it did, but it, it has value that has to be protected over time. Finally, you know, my, my thoughts, will, I'll be back here at the panel, but a really good perspective, if you go to the University of Wyoming Extension Sheep Program, uh, we shared um, this segment from the IWTO conference. Again, there was four or five different perspectives on this market outlook. But for those of you that want a, a more in-depth uh, perspective directly from the mouth of those in those regions, and especially China and those manufacturing regions, I'd encourage you to, to spend some time watching this webinar. Um, I think it gives some really valuable insights into how the inter international market so drastically affects our domestic wool market. Um, all right, so Rita, do you have some slides that you'd like me to pull up while you're talking to us? You might have to unmute, Rita. There we go. There we go. Um, I don't have anything on the international market and exports because uh, I think you've covered some excellent points. So I don't want to be redundant with what you've mentioned. Um, and I think you've sort of put a perspective as to how important not only is the export market to us, 
but also how important the chain of demand is very, very important. So uh, what we're experiencing, I've been calling it, you know, sort of the double whammy. What we've had is in the United States, we were hit, first of all, with the increased import, increased tariffs from China. So all of our wool went to China, started out with a 10% tariff, and then it went up to uh, 25%. We could kind of deal with 10% tariff, and there weren't so many changes when that happened in October of 19, of 18. But after that, uh, they turned, they um, increased the tariffs to 25, and that's been pretty unbearable to, um, to tolerate. So we've really saw a drastic reduction in um, exports to China. And China takes about 72% of our raw wool exports. So it's huge, it's enormous. Um, we didn't like it that way, but it's, uh, it's, it's been difficult. Some of the wools that we really need to sell, some of the uh, little bit coarser, maybe a little bit shorter wools, I found a nice home in China, so that ended up being an important market for us. Um, since we've, since, again, since the uh, China trade war and, and into January, January 2020, we saw a great decrease. And then COVID happened. And of course, as everyone knows, that started in China. And I think the effect on that into China was not just that we had, um, our exports had a tariff on them, but the, the apparel items from China had a tariff coming to the United States. And we're a big market for China. So as you sort of so showed, I think, so, where, so well with is how important that textile chain is. And when you start seeing a reduction in um, apparel sales is you're going to have less fabric, less yarn, less wool is needed. So there was a slight impact. I mean, we're not the only market for China. So that began to mess up the market. And I think uh, we saw a little uh, softness in the market. Then the other thing, then we got hit with COVID-19. So that overall, the prices are down 42% over last year. And about 20% of that is just during the last few months with COVID-19. So um, we're, we did begin to look at some other markets after we lost a lot of China. So Egypt's been an important market as well as a few others. But since then, unfortunately, we just haven't had much movement. It, uh, India used to be an important market a couple of years ago. And um, all the uh, feedback we get from some of the agents in India is that uh, everything's pretty much closed and there's not a lot happening in India either. So those would be in the last couple of months it's happened. So I think we're gonna see those exports continue to change. I think we're gonna change because the demand is gonna be, it's gonna change and we're gonna continue to see that affect us down the road. So um, export market is suffering quite a bit. Um, we've seen a, in not only in wool, but in sheepskin also, the percent of change in wool exports uh, year and year was about 88%, and then sheepskin was like six, 76%. So significant decrease uh, in that, but I think you know we'll start seeing maybe just a little bit of a turnaround. We're seeing just a, I've seen just a couple of bites in the last week or two, so hopefully that'll turn around a little bit and we'll see some improvement in this market. So. Um, I think that's, the other thing I do want to mention, there's two other things. One is uh, the price decrease, and I think you might have heard this when, uh, with Chris Wilcox, uh, who is a chief economist in Australia and does a lot around the world, has mentioned also we're not the only fiber decreasing. All of our other competitive fibers have decreased. Polyester's decreased, cotton has decreased. And so a lot of those fibers, so um, our competition with other fibers is we're in the same, we're in the same boat as they are. So that won't be as much of a factor, but the demand I think will be a big factor going forward. I think that's about all I have on the export market. And we probably want to spend some time, whenever you want to go into it, on some of the, uh, the loan deficiency program. I've shared the screen of ASI's website to go through this read. If you can see it, you just tell me how to scroll. Through the website? Wait, we're actually seeing your PowerPoint again. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Can you see it now? No? <laughs> okay. 
So, I, I, as you're doing that, I can go ahead and uh, and just talk a little bit about the program. You can go to our website and um, see the uh, LDP what the LDP rates are. I think this is an important program because thank you to all the industry that participated. With, you mentioned the importance of price reporting, and um, there you go. You mention, in, mentioned the importance of price reporting, and this is one of the instances where it's helpful for industry to know what's happening um, with prices. The, the, uh, to come up with these, for, the, for those of you that are not familiar with the Market Assistant Loan and LDP, it's a program set up by uh, USDA FSA, and it's a program that basically helps when wool prices are low. It's meant there to be to help when wool prices loan are low. And you can either get a LDP, just a one-time payment, or you can get a loan, a market assistance loan. So if you can look at this, um, the two things that are fixed, if I can point them out, um, the if you scroll down on the left, well, X right there, excuse me. I've met someone's eyes, but we'll scroll down right, right there. And in that chart where it says grease price, it's kind of bolded. It's about the bottom fourth of the page to the left. That grease price of 40 cents, that whole column there where it says 2020 loan rate, that not the first column, but the second column, that loan rate is fixed on an average of $1.15 grease. So they do, USDA does their magic some way and comes up with these rates as a loan rate and the average comes up to $1.15. That cannot be changed until there's a new farm bill. The other fixed amount is the 40 cents that's there. So that ungraded amount under the loan rate is 40 cents. So those will stay the same. Um, the $1.15 and 40 will not, the average of $1.15 grease, it's confusing because you wonder how these add up average to $1.15, um, but it, you of course have to convert them to a clean price. Um, so the loan rate, um, you can see the loan rate there, and then you see a repayment rate in the third column. And in that column, those are the rates that are reported every week. And there are some problems in that one in that you can look at 22 micron, the repayment rates higher than the 18 micron. So those are some issues that we're working with um, at FSA, and they've been inc incredibly responsive in working with this. So I hope that we see some change in this. Uh, optimistically, it might be as soon as next week, but it may take a little bit longer. It may take a few weeks to uh, fix those repayment rates. That's if you want to get a loan. If you want to get a loan, your loan if you want to get a loan, those are the rates that you can get a loan on the far left there. Excuse me, like that, the under 2020 loan rate, that's your loan. That's what you can go get a loan by. And then you repay it on the column that's in on to the right of that. So um, right now, uh, it's you can get a, a loan for, let's say, uh, 19 micron for 294 and your repayment, your effective repayment rate is 315. So, so it's really, so you you would have to, you can use these loans for 12 months, so they're operating loans. And it used to be nine, but they have a, because of COVID, they've increased that to 12 months. So uh, what you would have to repay, you can borrow 294, um, and then you'd have to repay, uh, the, the highest you'd have to pay is 294. But if you go one up, it's your loan rate is 338. You can get a loan for that for 12 months. But if the week that you choose to repay is lower, you pay that lower rate of 332. And you get to keep that difference. So it's a little bit complicated and I won't go into it much more because I think I'm getting down the weeds a little bit. But um, the important thing is, is that you do have the opportunity, if you want to get a 12-month loan, you can do this. And those are the rates, the loan rates there in that second column are what the rates are. You do have to get a micron on your wool, and you have to do that through New Zealand Wool Testing Authority. Um, 
that's the only approved lab that's currently open that uh, the results that they will use. And if you don't want to get a micron, I think the program that will be used the most is that ungraded wool price. Currently, that is at 30 cents. So if you have, if you own your wool, you have to own your wool, you have to have beneficial interest and control over your wool, you can go and get a LDP one-time payment for 30 cents. Um, so I think that's going to be of interest to a lot of people that hadn't moved for a long time. It was somewhere around three cents for quite some time. So thanks to the industry participation, we were able to actually show how poor the market is doing and uh, show that the industry did need uh, support and prices were very, very low. If you don't mind scrolling down just a tad there. What? Um, there's some right there, there's some program information about eligibility. If you go to our website about the loan deficiency program eligibility, and there's also um, a link to a fact sheet that will give you a lot of these details. So um, I do think, uh, and one other point I wanted to bring up also, excuse me, uh, not only is this payment rate for growers, but it's also, there is an unshorn pelt payment to, um, for pelts. So for lambs that aren't shorn, there is an unpelt, unshorn pelt payment, and you would take 30 cents times six, six pounds. I did it the other day, I don't have it right in front of me. I think it comes out to, it's like two, a dollar something, but let me figure that out real soon. But if you take your repayment rate of 30 cents times six, pounds, that would be your repayment rate for uh, the pelt market. So I think that'll be of interest to a lot of people um, that have lambs and can get paid a rate for their wool on the lambs as well as for ewes and sheep shorn in 2020. Um, go to our website, there's a lot of information there. We do recommend that you go register with your FSA office so that you um, can fill out all the paperwork and stuff immediately. And then you can choose what date to sell to um, get your loan. They do change. Like I said, this loan rate was at three cents for a long time. It's just now up to 30 cents. So they do change week to week. So you just sort of want to watch it. Um, they, uh, this is posted every Tuesday. And then you can decide when you want to uh, take your wool and, and submit for uh, LDP the loan deficiency payment. Rita, we have a question for clarification here. Sure. Um, is the clean price half of the price we see, so it would be half of 294, for example? The clean price, yeah. Um, so what do you, uh, so 294, your loan, that's your loan rate. So that 294 that you have for 19 micron is your loan rate. So when you get your, let's say that you get your objective measurement results and it, you have a 19, let's say you have a 20 micron wool. You can go and ask for a loan for $2.94 on, on, on a clean basis on clean pounds. Like when you go, um, so that's what your loan would be. What you repay is what the repayment rate is at that date. So that third column, when you choose to repay, you would repay the amount in the third column, and it would be either your loan rate or the repayment rate, whichever is lower. So in that situation, as you can see, the repayment rate's higher, so you would still pay 294. You wouldn't have to pay more. Does that, I hope that makes sense. If you go up to 18.6, your repayment rate, so one down, your repayment rate is right there, right? Your repayment rate there in that second column is $3.38. Your, your loan rate is $3.38. That's, that's how much you can loan, how much, you can, how much of a loan you can get for 12 months until you repay the loan. Your repayment rate is $3.32. So you can pay back the 332 and 
pocket the six cent difference. Perfect. So Rita, we'll just this this page right here is is pretty critical, I think, to to for folks to take note of. And I guess we just mentioned that these these rules don't make themselves, and we really appreciate your efforts to uh, uh, both both the producers chiming in, but all, your uh, heavy lifting to get these things pushed forward. They don't just happen. So thank you. Any other concluding thoughts, Rita, on this? Um, no, um, the the, uh, the good news is that the market's been strong enough for so many years, and even you know the experts in the wool industry have always said that it it's been higher for a longer period of time than it ever had been in the history of the wool market. So we were able to enjoy those wool markets directly from the market. It's great that we have this in place. So when wool prices are low, that this helps us. And so I do think it is a time that it will be of some help to growers. It's not huge, but it is some assistance on top of what I think Peter's going to cover with some of the um, CFAP, the COVID um, relief. But so um, I hope people will look at it. I always, we always encourage everyone to go talk to your, your FSA office, register or go talk to them early, get your, get everything set up so that when you want to activate it, you can, and you can go to our ASA ASI website, sheepusa.org. And on the homepage, there's an LDP button. Um, and it, you'll come to this page that we're looking on the website and you will see that uh, you'll have all the most current information. And again, it's updated every Tuesday. Excellent. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Rita. We really appreciate that. You alluded to the fact Peter was going to talk a little bit more about some of the other programs. Um, Peter, yes. are you on? I am, if I got my mute button turned off. I just very, very right. uh, hit the, uh, the uh, pandemic uh, assistance program. USDA just uh, released this information on Tuesday. And uh, very obvious that they wanted to start with the 2019 uh, crop uh, impacts um, of the coronavirus hit on the markets. And so the provision they put in for wool, and it's important that wool is in there, lamb is in there, and these are market conditions that have been hammered uh, by the pandemic. They want to work with the leftover wools from 2019 so for the uh for the producers that had wool that was unsold uh, from 2019 take that inventory uh those pounds uh you'll be able to certify those to usda and they have uh, rates that they can pay you both on the greasy basis or on the clean basis for the unsold wools that you had stored yet um, in January. And there is there is a provision they'll pay you up to, to half of, uh, of your total production uh, for 2019. And that's done purely for budget purposes, as is most of the pandemic um, um, payments. Uh, whether it's payment limitations or only covering the damage to 80%, the second row uh, covering it to 20%. That was purely done by budgeting. Um, USDA, members of Congress, industry, uh, we pushed for $50 billion for this uh, aid package and we wound up with 16. And so they had to make a lot of uh, decisions to try to stay within budget. But very obvious to us that the, the, the pandemic uh, program that was rolled out for livestock uh, including lamb specifically, including wool specifically, is aimed at the 2019 production that got hit by the pandemic. And, uh, and I think there was a real recognition on the lamb feeders as well. That's important from the wool side. They had hundreds of thousands of pounds of wool that they've been stored, lamb's wool. Um, so Hopefully we get this first installment through, uh, pick up the wools that weren't sold for 19, pick up the, the, 
a lot of the feeder losses that occurred. And then when we come back around, and we're going to be working on it in June again, is looking at the next round of funding with the goal that you would naturally move to the 20 wool clip and move to the 2020 lamb crop. Peter, those details, are they in the same page? Um, those recent uh, rules that just came out, you said on Tuesday, where can they yep, access that, those details? They, they, yep, there's a home button right on the right on the home page. There's a there's a button that you can like. It says COVID, COVID nineteen right on the home page uh, that you can hit that. Okay. And we were uh, visiting with the Farm Service Agency, and and as Rita had mentioned, we have been visiting with that folk, with with those people weekly for for the last two months, and they plan to have uh, the forms. For the for the assistance program uh, available uh, next week and a calculator so that if you have leftover 19 wool if you are applying on the, uh, the use of uh, and the lambs under two years of age the forms and the calculator are both going to be available at the FSA website next week perfect excellent so be patient it'll it'll be there next week It'll be there next week. Perfect. Well, again, thanks, Peter. We really appreciate it. And we know you've been working pretty hard to get this done with everyone. So thank you. All right. Do we have Reed or Ronald on? I'm not seeing. I see Reed. Reed, are you there? Are you muted? I'm here. Can you hear me? There we are. Thank you for being on, Reed. It's all yours. All right. Well, I saw Producers was on here. I thought that was Ronald. So make sure he can't get on. How's that? There he is. Okay, all right. I'm in the dark. Uh, just quick update on the uh, wool lab and where we're on the commercial side of it. Uh, as far as our timeline, uh, we're probably two to three months behind at this point just due to the uh, virus and uh, some of it has to do with uh, the university slowing down their procedures. NZWTA is closed uh, down for a period of time and their manufacturing is not up to, to speed again. So um, uh, our timeline is off a little bit. We have posted the lab manager position. Uh, we'll be looking at those over the next uh, few weeks uh, and hopefully making a decision very soon on that. Our electrical water, electrical and water supply and wastewater, uh, they're all on go. Uh, we don't expect any surprises there. We have uh, plans in place to have that all, all taken care of. Uh, remodeling, uh, we are uh, doing things in our current lab, taking equipment out that uh, is unnecessary, rearranging uh, 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 equipment that we have that will stay in place and uh, to make room for the new equipment coming in. Uh, we will be getting a, a new, uh, new uh, near-infrared uh, so that we can start doing uh, residual grease and ash uh, through the NIR as opposed to the old traditional way of the soxalate and ashing ovens. We will be getting samples back from New Zealand Wool Testing Authority on uh, wool samples that have been submitted uh, from the U.S. there this year and uh, so that we can start calibrating that NIR. Uh, and that'll take a little bit of time. We'll probably have to do the old fashioned way for a period of time, but look forward to uh, being able to use NIR uh, going forward. Um, we will be getting uh, uh, various uh, samples uh, from around the United States so that we make sure that uh, we're not just calibrating on one region or one style of wool when it comes to these residuals. Um, 
bottom line is we'll be operational uh, 2021. Excellent. Ronald, quick question is, is the lab, is the intention to be IWTO certified or, or ASTM? What are, what are your thoughts on that trajectory? Well, ASTM does not certify labs. They only certify procedures. Uh, that's what a Angus did over the years. Uh, ASTM uh, it will be our protocol going forward until we get another laser scan in. And that'll probably be uh, go in the future. Um, I can tell you right now, it's it's a pretty daunting task uh, dealing with, um, well, let me just say, it's not like uh, commercial people would operate uh, dealing with uh, universities and, and other entities and, and funding and so forth. So it takes a little longer. Uh, so um, it'll, it'll be, uh, it won't be this year that we'll be IWTO certified, but that is our goal going forward. Well, it sounds like you're busy, Ronald. Don't don't let it kill you. Well, thanks. <laughs> that, I'm joking. I don't. We appreciate it. We know that's a tall task, and I, I think you alluded to the the red tape that often exists in in some of our organizations. So, thank you. Well, we appreciate that update. We look forward to keeping it domestic. So. All right, um, before we run into the panel, I, I failed to just give a brief update. I talked to Diego Pauliers from uh, Chargiers this week and uh, he was okay with me kind of giving an update. You know, we alluded to the fact that, um, you know, in our Intermountain West region, we produce a pretty fine uh, clip and in certain parts of the US that, that predominates in terms of wool production. And so a lot of that does stay domestic. Um, some recent developments there are due to the slowdown. Um, the end of this week, Chargiers will be temporarily, and I wanna highlight temporarily, um, stopping production in terms of the processing for about four to six weeks tentatively. Um, and that goes back to, again, some of the, the demand dynamics out there. They're still receiving wool, um, but uh, they are not gonna process for four to six weeks. Um, and, and he highlighted the fact that he's expecting for things to pick up I think we're all optimistic that they will. We're kind of in uncharted waters in some regards. Um, but I think he's, he's the deterioration of demand for those, those finished product after the first stage processing has led to uh, the need to, to maintain the facility, keep everybody there. Um, he highlighted the fact how important that, that skilled workforce is to the organization. And, um, you know, I, I think for those of us on the call that may not be aware, Chargiers is really uh, a critical aspect of our infrastructure. And I think as we, we think about long-term implications of coming out of this, um, our infrastructure at this stage of the game, we can't afford to lose any of it, um, both on the lamb side and on the wool side. And so, uh, but again, I just want to highlight stop production for four to six weeks. It'll wrap up tomorrow, um, but they still are receiving wool. Um, all right. Any questions up until this point? I think the good, the real good stuff is is me putting these guys on the spot. I really appreciate them being on. Um, Caitlin, interrupt me if there's some stuff that I need to. Wait, can you see the chat questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think we're gonna hold those for a sec. Um, we're going to hold those and we're going to get through the panel because I think we're going to answer some of those. The aspects on the LDP and some of the, 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 the aspects of that, um, I, I think we, we could get lost in the woods a little bit with that for right now. We might revisit that. Um, I'm happy to, to answer some of those or direct those questions after we get through some of uh, the marketing input from some of the, the representatives on the call. So the way we're gonna do this, again, I appreciate my panelists for being on. Can you see my screen or do I need to share it again? I need to share it again. Oh boy, all right. That fires in, here we go. There we go, All right. looks good. Okay, so we're really grateful. We have Larry Prager from Center of the Nation Wool out of Belfouche, South Dakota. Um, I'm not sure 
Bruce is with us or not, Bruce, correct me if you're out there uh, from Great Plains Wool Company. Uh, ben Hostetler from Mountain Meadow Wool Mill out of Buffalo, Wyoming. Uh, Will Griggs with Utah Wool Marketing Association in Tooele. And then Ronald, if you're still on, I'm putting you on the spot again. I owe you um, with PMCI. And so I guess what I, I asked our panelists to just give a, a two to three minute update, their perspective, their major take home before we open it up to questions. And, and given the fact that there was a, a large sale today in Utah, I'm going to let Will open it up. Will, feel free to share uh, what, what you'd like to. And then uh, we'll, we'll follow it up with Larry. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. So we offered out 2.3 pounds today. Um, 550,000 pounds of that is 2019 wool. So leaves us with 1.76 million pounds of 20 wool. We uh, usually have a, a sale in, in April, but we had to uh, push that to today uh, because of various reasons, obvious reasons. Um, of that, uh, well, let me back. Here. Of the 2019, what we only received bid about 26,000 pounds. The buyers were more interested in getting into the 20. Um, of the 2020 clip, we were basically we we basically only had bids on a, a 1.4 million, and the reason for that is once we got into the long list of shoals, we only had one bidder, so I shut that down. Um, there's no sense wasting time. You only have one bidder. Uh, the high volume today was Keys, which was representing Chargers. We're uh, high on 46% of the of what was bid on. Second would be Lempier at 8%, and Anodyne 25%. So. Uh, Format of our cell was we started out in ungraded white face bellies and wool. We moved into some uh, merino cell finer wools, and then we went into what would consider more the crossbred white face or excuse me, Rambouillet Columbia style wools or graded. And uh, then the Yearland wool, the short wool, and then our offs. So Yesterday, at lunch, uh, while the buyers were looking at these wools, we for lunch, and the main concerns was how much of this wool is going to sell. Are the producers willing to sell at the levels that we're at today? Especially taking in mind all these government programs that are soon available. Well, LDP available now through the loan, uh, especially the loan because the majority of these wolves don't fall under the category that would receive an LDP at this moment. The, uh, in Utah, we have a grant that's available um, for up to $40,000. And then the, the other two uh, programs that were just announced last few days. Yeah, I couldn't answer the question as to how many would help. Uh, I just don't know that. I don't think I don't think Larry would know that, but I would say probably less than half. But uh, I, coming to this this offering, I was under the impression that we had uh, basically one very interested buyer in kind of the finer rules, and two that did any business and were very limited entry. Uh, what I found was. Uh, that we had a pretty active sell today, as you can tell by percentages. Um, I'll say that the rated wolves fared fared the worst. Uh, they're in the less than a third to a dot twenty range, depending on microns. And uh, the finer wolves, the, the the merino style wool, were our highest price today was on an 18 micron just a super nice it's a two bell lot 
uh, 60% yielding for 235 greasy. Um, but really, two dollars and below was where everything was trading today. And uh, so essentially, I've been looking at comparisons from last year. If you look at uh, these prices compared with what we're trading in April of 2019, about 45 to 55 cent off. Um, if you look at the me offering that we had last year, which was about 25% off of the April, compared to these price, it's anywhere from 40 to 55% off so far. I haven't done all of yours yet, uh, but that's what I'm seeing so far. I will also say that short walls are, are, are definitely uh, 50 to 60 percent right now at least with the figures that I I just did a few figures because I knew I was going to be on this but short wools are fair and uh, close to a dollar just over a dollar for short wools and so better if they've got a little blink that uh, to them at all and then and some things they'll they'll be up in the dollar 30 range And uh, I mean, I, I welcome any question or, or if, if there's my mess, please know. That's excellent. Well, I have a question to kind of stimulate some that may be coming in. Caitlin, I lost my chat box, so I'll let you help me with that. Will, what, what is demand like for some of the 23 and, and coarser right now? I, you might have said, but I couldn't hear really well. Oh, there was there was good demand for uh, I mean I didn't have any no bids on microns that I offered today I did offer up to 26 uh, as far as wise wolves are concerned but I had I didn't have any no bids so there was some there was demand for all microns it was just at survivals uh, I'd say the 22s and finer were in the dollar 80 to two plus range. Um, the 23s, fours, and fives were in the 240 to two, or excuse me, 140 to, to one C range. And then anything coarser than that, actually the 26s and uh, 25.6s, some of those were less dollar. Excellent, thank you. All right, we'll, we're going to circle back and you'll stay on with us when we really open it up um, for other questions. So we're going to we're going to bounce over to Larry. Larry, you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yep. Good enough. Uh, well, uh, I'll just uh, be brief. I uh, want to uh, uh, follow up a little bit with what Will said and what's been said earlier. But but I think maybe uh, uh, regionally around Belfouche, I'm going to call it the Intermountain region. Uh, that, that we serve, uh, you know, shearing is just nearly over. And a couple of comments that I would make about that. We, I think the crews, uh, I was a little bit concerned that we might have work slowdowns or crew would get in trouble with, with uh, you know, traveling. And, uh, but truly, we got through without any delays. Uh, good crews uh, on time, good bales, uh, well prepared. I think the, the crews, really uh, served, I think, our industry well in the trade area that we're part of. Uh, uh, we're receiving trucks still on a, on a daily and weekly basis. Uh, uh, volume, I think, is close to normal inbound, maybe a little bit slower. But, uh, you know, a year ago we had hot prices and quick as those wolves were shorn, they were in the, on the truck and in by the next day. And, and it's, you know, now they're pretty, pretty common that these wolves are shorn and been on the trailer for a week or two until they get some work done. So anyway, things are close to normal that way. Uh, a couple of things that are not normal. Uh, uh, the, the wool's coming in, and, and we've had pretty good experience with New Zealand wool testing. Uh, we can say that maybe maybe there's a bit of a benefit on yield there, but it's not that much. It's, it's fairly fractional. But we're seeing just super style wool's coming in the door for whatever reason. Uh, we had a good grass here, good ground cover. Sheep stayed out in the range most of the time. We are having yields that are just, uh, I've never seen them. In all the years I've been around the warehouse trade, I've never seen uh, the yields coming in like they are. We're, we're averaging 60 plus in the Belfouche and, and Montana regions. Uh, Wyoming particularly, good length, 
uh, just a lot of real positive things for quality. And, and that's, that's a great thing. So uh, that's, that's one thing that's different. Uh, we're having, uh, but selling wool is a bit of a different matter, you know, uh, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit, but uh, we've been offering and selling wool on a weekly basis going back to uh, probably mid-February. Uh, uh, nobody likes the, the price the producer level. They don't sound very good. They're hard to compare with the last three or four years, particularly the last two. And, uh, you know, that's just, uh, just the facts of, of the market. But either way, when you brought the best clip of wool you've ever shown to the warehouse, uh, it's hard to take less money. It just is. And so there's significant price uh, reluctance, I guess, if you will, reluctant sellers. Uh, but I mean, we, uh, how much are we going to sell? How much are we going to save? Well, there's, there's a good group of uh, reluctant sellers that are uh, going to wait for this market to heal up. Okay. And I, and I think that's probably true uh, across the U.S. I, I just suspect that that's, that's going to be the case. Uh, but as usual, the finer, long staple, well-prepared, uh, I'm going to call them class, well-classed wools are in, in contamination-free environments. Uh, those are the clips that always lead the charge, if you will, draw the most attention. And, uh, and they will, I think that's true, whether it's now, whether it's in October or, or the ones that have already been in the warehouse. So, but missing out truly and with very passive demand, it's just like Will, I think, uh, spoke to, uh, the short, uh, wools with high veg, mixed grade and length lots, just wool in the bag, if you will. Uh, and I've, I've got it, the note on my page is about 25 micron and coarser. Uh, those price discounts are pretty severe. And, and, and anything with a quality issue is just in a very passive situation. Uh, if, if you can find one bidder, uh, you'll, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's about all we're seeing uh, on our spot. So. Uh, some producers are going to store this wool for a later day, and uh, so the question is always asked: uh, you know, how long, how long before it gets better? Uh, great question. Uh, I'm not sure what the answer is, uh, uh, but a couple of thoughts I've got there. I think, I think if you look around the world, uh, Australia is having some of the same problems. Uh, they don't have uh, much participation outside of China; haven't had for quite a while, and we've got international trade channels across the world and, and manufacturing and, and work stoppages uh, by the global health concerns. You know, the pandemic has brought uh, delays throughout the supply chain and manufacturing chain. So the real question is not maybe how do we heal this market or how long it is. I, I really think the real question has to be, you know, what's consumer demand going to be after the pandemic? Uh, I, I think that's a, it, it's a great question. I don't think anybody knows. All of us hope we can just, uh, you know, go back to normal, whatever normal is going to be. I, I suspect, though, that that shopping channels, uh, shopping uh, experiences, maybe. Uh, I, I think uh, one of the fears that I have is that consumers around the world have closed their checkbook at the same time. And if that's true, then the demand cycle is temporarily on. I'll, I'll just call it uh, on pause. And, uh, and we're gonna have to deal with that. Uh, I think whether we, whether we store the wool long-term, let's say, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna say through the summer, because we're sitting here on Memorial Day weekend nearly. And, uh, and in, a, in a regular year, we'd have most of these wools sold by now and, and checks written. Uh, I don't know what percentage of our sales are at this point compared to uh, say the last three or four years average, but I'd be willing to bet we're, we're less than half. That's, that's just my guess. Uh, uh, so with that, uh, I'll, uh, I'll wait for, you know, the, the truth is the answer to a lot of these questions, no one knows, but before we're gonna see a healing in the market, we've got international trade channels reestablished, Europeans back at their desks, uh, manufacturing with the doors open and lights on. Excellent. Thank you, Larry. We'll go ahead and move to, to Bruce. Bruce, if you jumped on late, just your thoughts, a couple of um, take-home messages from your perspective, and then we'll throw some questions at, at everybody after we hear from Ben. Sure. I uh, 
Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Yeah, just to kind of reiterate some of the things Larry and Will said, you know, this year the the wool seems to be very clean in this area, Montana, Wyoming, especially. Uh, I think we're seeing some yields like we've never seen before. And a lot of that's due to the good year. Last year, the staple length's long, and we had plenty of moisture going into fall and winter. And so it's going to make, uh, these are really pretty wolves, and they actually will store well. I mean, I kind of hate to uh, say that <laughs> because uh, I was over in a warehouse in Gillette, Wyoming the other day, and several producers were in there. We had a little wool class going on there was some wool left over from last year and everyone was looking at the differences in the year old wool versus the same clip of wool that brought in this year and there is already a significant color change and talking to uh, the guys at Chargeur and the guys at Bowman around the scouring every day uh, they're definitely there definitely will be a residual of that yellow color in the year old wool. I mean, whether you like to believe it or not, maybe your granddad said, well, I used to keep wool for five years and then I sold it and you know everything was great. Well, I think I could tell you that's probably not the truth. I mean, granddad may not have told you what he got for it five years later, but uh, there's definitely a, gonna be a color change and I've already had several producers this year talk about, well, maybe I'm going to hold it again for another year. When you get to two-year-old wool, I can just tell you, when you look at the color change in one year, in two years, it'll double. And I think Will and Larry probably have seen that better than me. And inside the warehouse, when you have wool stored, it definitely changes color. Um, getting back to what uh, market conditions would be. The fine wool, we've been able to purchase and to market the wools probably underneath 24 micron all along this spring. Maybe not at the prices that the producers were hoping to get, but there is some movement there. Um, we worked pretty hard all fall trying to open up some new markets in Europe and uh, then as soon as this coronavirus hit, you know, Italy, uh, France, Spain just came to a total lockdown. So that ended that market real quick, but we were able to move a little bit of wool there early this spring. Uh, now everything that's moved in the last probably 45 days has been domestically and to cover old contracts. I mean, I don't really believe it's any new contracts. It's just wool being purchased to cover contracts that were made before the coronavirus hit. And people are asking every day, you know, well, you, you're in this industry, so what do you see as far as trying to keep the wool? You know, I mean, are we gonna, are we looking at two months? Are we looking at six months? Or are we looking at a year? Well, I don't have a crystal ball, but as of, uh, Monday when Australia decided they would jump on board with Trump to uh, further the investigation into the Wuhan laboratories. Uh, now that's going to put a lot more pressure on the Australian market. So I guess we're going to have to wait and see next week in Australia. Uh, as Larry mentioned, I mean, all the activity right now is Chinese. And so the top, uh, four or five buyers for the last probably eight weeks has been Chinese. And so uh, as this, this battle between the Chinese and the rest of the world continues, I guess that's one thing we're gonna have to look at as far as, as where wool prices go. You know, we, we only have one benchmark to, try to price our wolves in this country and that's against the Australian wool markets right now. So that's something that's going to be very volatile. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you very much. I, 
again, I'd encourage you folks to check out the, the IWTO market outlook from Chris Wilcox. There's a segment in there from the Chinese uh, Wool Textile Association. And uh, just to echo what Bruce said is they're down about 18% um, this year already, and they're operating at about 80% of their production. But what was really interesting from what she said is that there's a lot of firms that process wool that are going to be going out of business. And she numerous times and again you know it's it's one source of information but uh, she says there will be more failures of companies this year than they've ever had in their developed economy in terms of, of wool manufacturing and so um, yeah that's that's an elephant in the room i think uh okay thank you again bruce thank you larry uh ben i'm going to turn it over to you for a sec ben is with mountain metal wool and ben's just going to provide just kind of an alternative perspective from a domestic mill um, standpoint. Well, uh, yeah, just a couple things on my end. You know, we're a grain of sand in that overall scale of, of the wool industry. So uh, my perspective is very limited in scope. But from what we see in general, there's the consumer driven demand. And on our side, it's mainly the craft industry. So people staying at home are our, our craft sales. So whether that's someone at home knitting, uh, about a six-fold increase over last year. Um, and that's through, it's been growing every month. So March is about a three-fold increase. Uh, April, about a five-fold increase. And May is looking like a six or almost a seven-fold increase over 2019 in terms of the craft industry. I suspect that'll drop away as summer warms up and people start leaving their homes. And um, But it just kind of shows that that consumer-driven demand in the, in the craft industry is still growing. Uh, key themes of sustainable US made, uh, the durability, we get a lot of the kind of the eco-friendly apparel industry looking for long lasting clothing and wool fits that category very well. So I think it, it, it kind of stabilizes that, um, that durable outwear, outerwear uh, industry. Wholesale from our side, wholesale is basically completely gone. Um, and I think that's just a lot of uncertainty from the the finishers. So if we sell wholesale to yarn stores, which are closed or um, other finishers who are going to take it and dye it, there's a lot of uncertainty of where they're headed this, this year. So that, in, that market has basically dropped away. We typically see a June to September pretty big increase in our wholesale business. So we're still you know, a month away from middle of June when those orders will start coming in. And it'll be very curious to see if that picks up in middle of June um, like it does historically. So that's kind of an un, undetermined uh, aspect of the industry right now. Um, on the apparel side, we have been receiving lots of inquiries on converting overseas production to domestic production. Um, so that's apparel brands who are looking for a new niche market that's going to be a U.S. made uh, product supply chain. Um, th the challenge with that is a lot of those apparel industries, they're already set in their contracts. They've already planned 2019 production is already in place. So they're looking for 2021. How do they pivot um, if supply chains are still changing and morphing throughout this next year? Um, but it, it's a, a pretty good uh, increase in those inquiries that we received coming in. Uh, there's still sticker shock. So if they have been doing a completely de uh, foreign supply chain um, for their entire product lines, there's a bit of a sticker shock when they look at a U.S. supply line, especially for us as a regional, a small regional processor, uh, definitely a sticker shock there when they start having those conversations. We've had lots of 17, 18 micron inquiries. Um, so some of those apparel brands, um, that seems to be dominating the conversations with them as they're looking for a 17, 18 micron um, supply chain. And, and basically we kind of tell them that's just not our bread and butter in terms of what we're providing. Um, it just is interesting out there um, looking at that. Looking at producers, so we also have a demand from producers around the country looking for what I'd call, they're looking for a new market. They're looking for something, you know, the wool market's bad, so they're trying to find something new to do. Generally, a an overall lack of understanding of marketing operations, the options that they have available, costs. Um, they're, they're kind of on our end, uh, uh, ones we want to push away and tell them to hold off and just hold on to that wool rather than make a bad decision and try and develop a business plan on, on uh, kind of desperate situations. It's just kind of that, yeah, that lack of understanding of what they're trying to do. The ones who already have a business in place. So that's a lot of your small farms um, around the country. I've heard from many of them that their businesses are, are booming right now. So they're, they're small hobby farms who have, 
both an outlet for the, the meat side and also for the wool side. And that local, you know, within, you know, drive next door to your neighbor and get some food and, and get some wool clothing and, and their sales are doing very well. Um, and that's a small part of the industry, but they, it, it's a good part um, in looking at that, that long term. Uh, looking at general branding, um, what we see as a you know, small manufacturer and retailer that when things do pick up and supply chains are broken and, and companies are trying to reestablish their supply chains, there's going to be a, a demand when that picks up to fill their apparel orders. If, if consumer demand for apparel, for socks, if it does grow and come back, there's going to be an immediate demand from manufacturers and companies to try and, and, and meet those changing markets. And so we're trying to position ourselves to brand a larger traceable production um, supply of premium wools. And uh, we'll see how that goes, but it's, uh, I think it's an opportunity that exists in the U S right now to establish a premium brand for our wool. Um, that these these apparel brands can you take a, take advantage of if they come back to a U.S. supply. Um, so that's kind of kind of where we're at there. Wit, if that makes sense. Perfect, perfect. Thank you very much, Ben. Okay, so we're going to open it up for questions. I know we're going over a little bit. Um, um, let me, Caitlin, can you see any questions coming in? There's just a couple of them here. One was refer was re referring to an earlier question about how they figure out the clean weight of the wool. And then the other one was about, um, was the Yoko McColl a UWTO certified lab? Ronald, I think Ronald alluded to that earlier. Uh, Yoko McCall was ASTM. Um, uh, how do they determine the clean weight was the question? Yeah. Well. No, Yoko McCall was just a test lab. They were not IWTO certified. Um, basically used the same type of procedures, uh, IWTO procedures as ASTM. So the yields are the yields. And uh, so when you're looking at those um, loan rates and repayment rates, those are in clean prices. So you would take your own individual uh, yields and uh, convert them. So that uh, 19 or 20 micron, which was three cents uh, gain, if you would, uh, on a clean basis, if it was 50% yield, you'd get 1.5 cents per pound uh, advantage. So uh, I think that just kind of goes to even on the other ones that were up to 50 uh, cents, uh, unless they were over uh, 50 or uh, percent, you're probably going to be better off to go with a graded, ungraded uh, uh, payment if you're just going to do an LDP. Thank you, Ronald. Um, I have a question for Will to follow up on what Bruce was discussing a little bit. Will, the, some of the soft demand on 2019, is that related to some of the discoloration that was there? Or, um, why the soft demand on last year's clip so much? <laughs> uh, good question. The majority of the wool that we that we have from 2019 is fall shorn <clears throat> Idaho wool, and it's typically 24 to 26 cron. Has some tender throughout, and it's uh, somewhat heavy with with dirt. And mainly, I think mainly because. Of where we're at and where the buyers are at. Um, they're looking for fresh wool. Uh, I, maybe color would be something to consider a little bit, but some of these wools have only been about, oh, uh, 10 months, 11 months. So you're not, we're not seeing any discussion yet. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd say that mainly they're just looking, they want, to, they want the fresh stuff first. and. And the overall uh, majority of the volume for 2019 is the coarser fall shorn type wools. Excellent. Thank you for clarifying that. You know, I get, we get the question a lot, and I think this is a good for you guys that are buying the wool out there is, you know, there's discussion of, well, a, a really well classed and skirted clip, what should the premium be? Um, I guess you could, 
this is open to anybody. The value of a well-skirted clip in today's situations with the pandemic. Uh, anyone want to chime in on that a little bit? I'll, uh, I'll give my two cents. Uh, it depends on the market. <clears throat> in the last several years, four or five years, we've seen record high wool markets. And these guys are just hungry for wool. So we you just see as big a difference between, say, undid wool and graded wool. But today, I can tell you right now, from, from personal experience, these unaided wolves suffered tremendously by not being well paired. And so, uh, it, you know, it may have shown in these market years, but when we're in a, in a depression with the market, it definitely was gonna, gonna reflect. Uh, I might just add a, uh, this is Larry. I, I you know, I, uh, Will said something, I think it's real key and in, in our shop, uh, I see it every day. Uh, wolves that uh, maybe have got a, a good edge of short running through them that can have been pretty easily removed on shearing day. Uh, maybe some uh, 10 months shorn yearlings mixed in or something. Well, the, the backbone truly of the American wool business, as long as I've been around, has been uh, the military uniform business, uniform cloth business. They're going to take a solid three inch style staple. And, and that's, that, that's, that's the, uh, the benchmark. And, and they really don't have a discount for short for poorly prepared wool. So that's when it really comes, how, how much is the uh, discount? A lot of things, a lot of factors are gonna come into that, but it's, it really boils down to wools that, uh, that can be trusted for stain loads, uh, for length. Uh, and that's where preparation on shearing day really, uh, particularly on a soft market like we're in now, really is a big deal. Now, one other thing, if I might, uh, Larry jog my memory. Uh, the presence of, of scourable paint, uh, we're really seeing it's it interest, no interest type of deal. Like they're, they're now asking, I mean, they always do. They're very serious about it now. Is, does this producer paint brand? And they don't take, I don't know, or I'm, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. They want to know for sure. And they're paying a, a pretty good premium on those right now. Interesting. Bruce, you, you mentioned, you mentioned l last year, you see some of that red cement paint being used for marker sheet. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Or we can avoid some of that use? Yes. Yeah. So I'm not seeing as much of that this year because I kind of, I guess, got on the bandwagon last year, but um, it's definitely a problem. We have, we have quite a bit of wool sitting down in San Angelo now that has been dyed red by the producer in the winter with a cement dye. And uh, it, it, it became a huge problem. And when we were, able to find lots of markets for wool where color and colored fibers weren't that important. We were able to introduce some of these red bales into the scourings. But uh, the last couple of years, people have just gotten a lot pickier. The, the few mills here in the United States that I scour wool and sell to, uh, they're in particular uh, colors like uh, red, blue, green, just immediately send up flags of uh, panic to those guys. They, they're they really scared that uh, whatever they're dying and putting that wool into, that that's gonna show up uh, significantly. However, <clears throat> most of them, once it's actually got into the product, they're not having as big a problem as they thought they would, but it's still, you know, when you, you panic a client with some color in your wool, uh, it just turns them off. And next year they're looking to buy that wool from someone else. They're not wanting to buy that wool that might be a problem. You know, everybody's just trying to eliminate the problems before they really happen. And uh, so I would just, I recommend, and most of those are, you know, the huge range flocks where they're trying to, uh, 
find say bucks or, or weathers or I don't know really what all they're they're dying out there, but uh, that's one thing that they do die. Excellent. Caitlin, do we have a couple of questions? I think we could take one more and then we're gonna wrap this up. I don't have any more questions on, on my end. I think some may have come in to you directly through the chat. Hmm. There should be a view option there at the top of your screen somewhere. You can see the chat box. Yeah, I've got to stop the share to do that. Uh, okay, well, let me ask this question as a concluding um, thought to, to everybody. And this is what everyone's going to hate me for on our panel. Um, should you market your wool this year? That's, I guess that's the real take home. What are you, what are your thoughts? And we'll start from the top with Larry. Oh, great question, Whit. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> should you? Well, I, I, you know, I make a living talking to wool growers and, uh, uh, you know, there's kind of two general thoughts out there. Um, uh, a good friend of mine, not so long ago, uh, we were talking about the price of wool and, and, uh, and that question came up and he said, well, you know, I really, uh, uh, you know, I can't afford to run without a wool check. And a few minutes later he said, but I can't afford to, I can't afford to run with only half a wool check too. And there's a lot of people right there, uh, you know, because I've got growers in uh, that are you know, trying to borrow money for operating from their banker. And uh, in their face, where they're taking out a loan on the wool clip, either at their at their bank, maybe they already have, maybe they're thinking about a farm service loan. Uh, I mean, there's some options there for sure. And uh, but the truth is, no matter which option they take, that wool check is going to be so much less than last year that it's the the, the idea that we're going to gamble down the road and we're going to heal this market up, and uh, maybe let uh, this fall we'll take another look at it. And uh, uh, that's that's one school of thought. I mean, it's a resistance, price resistance, simply that. Um, and then there's the other folks that are just, you know, we're shearing this wool now, and and we think we'd rather have cash than gamble that this this pandemic is over. That I mean, they're just kind of there. And and so, should we sell it? Uh, you got to keep in mind. Yeah, we might be able to hold these wolves and gamble. The market comes back online. Europe gets back in business, consumer demand in this company rebounds. We probably won't go back to last year's prices, but, but there is a possibility. Uh, on the back side of that, the negative is that the sheep are growing another clip of wool as, as, uh, as the months go by. And that's true for Australia, that's true for us, uh, countries around the world. And so uh, the, real, the real question mark, and the answer to that question lies in, in what what does consumer demand look like in consumer spending uh, at, after the pandemic, whenever that occurs? Is this a three months question? If we're thinking about gambling with a wool clip for a month, let's say, uh, then we probably just as well, if we can get an offer on, we probably just will turn it in cash. If, you're, if your risk tolerance is say through uh, October, then that's another point in the market. But uh, uh, you know, should we sell it? I think it depends on individual growers' finances, their tolerance for risk, and where they're at with their banker. Bruce, thank you, Larry. Well, <clears throat> yeah, um, I guess just like Larry said, if you're thinking about uh, keeping it for a month or two, I don't think we're going to see any huge increases in the market right now. Um, I get a chance to talk to uh, some of the guys in the Limpery area overseas. And the thinking is right now with the Australian market in near future, uh, very little increases. And there will be probably an uptick in the market when the new wolves in Australia start coming off this fall. Uh, however, uh, Eric, Drans told me, he said, but if you're thinking that, for example, say 21, 22 micron is going to get it back up to $4 this year in 2020, he said, you're probably dreaming. He said, it's just not in the cards. There's too much wool out there to be purchased already 
that he's uh, fairly certain can be purchased underneath those levels. And, uh, you know, we saw, I think every micron this week, except uh, 21 micron uh, went down again. And so, uh, like I say, I just, I'm really worried about the Chinese now Australian battle over this Wuhan lab uh, deal. And if that starts to impact the wool market in Australia, well, it definitely this directly impacts us. Excellent. Will, I think I, think I know your answer because you guys had a sale today, but go ahead. Well, it's, I, I've practiced this talk uh, over and over again and had to see them with producers and gonna doing it for the next couple of days to we go over prices producers. And I agree with what both Larry and Bruce said. Uh, it's a certain combination of a bunch of things. But I think the bottom line is that if you if you're in financial need then sell it. And again, like they said, we we don't have a, a good piece on down the road here four or five months. I don't. I, I think things are going to take a lot longer to cover. And I was talking to Rick Powers yesterday and mentioned that Australia only has six months for this file. And we've got a file. And if we keep these moving, then as we do see an increase in the, in the kit, we're going to uh, extinguish that with the wolves coming in stock pile. And so it's going to take a while, even even if they went back to some uh, normal, uh, it's going to take a while to recover. Also, uh, I mean, I don't know, I'm not going to for the other warehousemen, but I'm not sure, uh, well, I know we can't warehouse another uh, season clip next year with, if we don't have wolf. And at least around the area, um, if this store is out from the 17 to square foot, and uh, it's not a very good, not a, not very good. Here in Blake, you can go to a fairly new building for about 55 cents a square foot. So if you do not on that, you're seeing a product that simply does not have any value in putting all of this into it. So there's that issue in mind, as well as your thing that Larry and Bruce mentioned a lot. Thank you. Um, Ronald, I'll let you give your concluding synopsis on, on this, if you're still on. Ronald, are you still there? If you are, you're muted. Maybe not. Okay. Well, I, we just want to thank everyone for participating. Again, I, I sound like a broken record. I'd encourage you to, to check out that IWTO market report that Chris Wilcox produced on Wednesday. Again, I really think the international perspectives that come from some of the Chinese uh, representatives is, is helpful. Uh, I think the insights tonight were really helpful. I think this kind of communication is valuable for everyone in the industry. And I'm just grateful for our panel. Thank you panel for doing this. I owe you all, okay, I already know that. So thank you. And uh, we will look forward to doing this again in the future. Thank you. David. And please take a minute to fill out a short evaluation for us. There's a link in the chat box, especially we'd like to know if there's other topics you would like to hear for similar programs, um, if you'd like to continue this. Um, Sort of offering so please do let us know if it was useful to you and if there are other topics you would like to hear about and i've also included the link to the youtube video of the recording of our previous webinar on lamb markets all right well thank you everyone have a good night we're thinking about you and uh we'll, we'll get through this thank you deb thanks, thanks a lot everyone. thanks caitlin good night deb.